Welcome to the presentation for the paper Fitted Radiance and Attenuation Model for Realistic Atmospheres by Alexander Wilkie and Petr Vevoda, who share first authorship, Tom Bashford Rogers, Lukas Hoschek, Tomasz Iser, Monika Kolajowa, Tobias Rittig and Jaroslav Krzywanek. With the exception of Petr Vevoda, who is also from Chaos Czech, the makers of Corona Renderer, and Tom Bashford Rogers, who's from the University of the West of England in Bristol. Everybody is from the computer graphics group of Charles University. My name is Alexander Wilkie, and I'm the paper author delivering the presentation. SIGGRAPH asked us to show our faces, so I'm saying hello in person. But for the remainder of the presentation, you will see only the slides and hear my voice. So, what is this paper about? It's about this sort of scene, outdoor rendering, where the dominant light source is, of course, the solar disk, but a very significant part of the illumination and appearance in the scene is provided by the sky dome, in other words, the atmosphere that surrounds our planet, both via inscattering and via attenuation, providing the highly varying appearance of outdoor scenes throughout the course of a day. And of course this is a well-known problem in computer graphics. The standard, easiest standard way to think about what constitutes a pixel on the sky is to think about it like case A, ray that goes to infinity, the radiance U C is the radiance that gets inscattered from particles in the atmosphere. But of course, in order to do compelling outdoor renderings, you need to solve all the components of the rendering problem, including in scattered radiance from finite distances, attenuation, and so on. Not just for observers on the ground, but for higher observer altitudes. And of course, state of the art is, given an atmospheric configuration, this can nowadays be done via full simulation, via path tracing. But if you, for an outdoor rendering, model the atmosphere to scale and place your assets into it, that is still just too expensive for routine use. And of course, this means it's been too expensive for the entirety of the existence of computer graphics. So there's actually quite a history of approximative solutions to make it work somehow. The oldest of which are, of course, HDR environment maps, which are very useful, however, static, and they do have their limitations because they don't have, they don't really easily provide something for finite viewing distances. There's approximative interactive techniques, there's reference solutions that also exist. These are not necessarily from graphics. And there, there's also a category of older models that are fitted in the sense that they did a brute force calculation and then tried to fit a function for fast evaluation during rendering. Now, a core of the current state of the art is that the interactive techniques, like the 2020 paper by Hilaire, which was about the sky rendering capabilities of the Unreal Engine, these techniques are there with regard to what you need in a game engine. They are based on lookup tables and limited ray matching. They are very flexible with regard to the atmospheric conditions you can work with. You can integrate clouds. This is geared mainly for interactive settings and it can generate visually stunning results in those. The only drawback, which is not a drawback for a game engine, is a full simulation of radiation transfer in an atmosphere. This is not. And it's a bit hard to say for those applications where accuracy would be needed, well, how much are we actually losing there? It looks stunning, which is, well, the point, but how much is missing? This is what the next category of software could answer. Things like Libratran. This is not graphic software at all. This is atmospheric science research software that is providing a large number of solvers for radiative transfer in the atmosphere outside the visible range not really made to generate images, although you can jerry-rig it to do so in a Python script that puts together an image from those solver outputs. 
And there's also these methods, Hoshek, Pritham et al, that did a pre-computation, tried to somehow bake a sky model into something that can be quickly evaluated and then plug that into a path tracer. These models are all significantly outdated insofar as they don't provide a full solution because the part on the right is missing that I've now colored gray. They only provide in scattered radiance for direct view rays that go to space, which does not mean that they look horrible necessarily if you use them as intended for ground level renderings. So that's a comparison of left fisheye capture of a real sky, right output of the Hoshek model. That's when it works. There's things on the ground, you're looking at them, you're not looking too much at the sky or at distant objects. And the next one is a bit unfair to the Hoshek model. Left is what should be there, that's a debugged planet, so to speak. It's a huge geometry that you're seeing there, so that's a, a planet to scale the Earth with a texture. And those poles that you see are 10 kilometers apart and 15 kilometers high. And we are at 8 kilometers altitude and looking into a fairly realistic simulated atmosphere with the sun setting at ground level, which means, of course, the tips of the poles are still illuminated. And of course, the Hoshek model can't do anything with that because it has no concept of all the components that are missing here. To give you a further indication of the size of the scene you're looking at here, that's a, an Airbus 380 to scale at the bottom of one of those pillars. So it's really quite, quite extensive. So, fitted models. Given that the interactive models are so good, why would you bother? Well, because for some cases, you still need accuracy. You want Libratran, which is also far too slow for production use. You want Libratran in a jar, including all those effects you sometimes need and which would be hard to do with the lookup table and ray matching approaches. Polarization, ground albedo, and so on. But if we want this, we have to fix a lot of things. In other words, provide all the missing pieces. The first thing we had to fix was we needed realistic atmospheric profiles because the Hoshek model as the most realistic fitted model actually didn't really make use of that property of fitted models. You can go overboard with the simulation part because you're only doing that once. That can take a long time, but then you compress the data set for quick evaluation. But it didn't use very realistic models of atmospheric scatter distribution, we did. We had to invent a new way of compressing the data set because the old approaches simply didn't work on the fully spherical images that we're working with. We also had to provide a transmission function in a specialized form that you can evaluate for finite distances. And we actually also provide polarization patterns. So the atmospheric composition, the main feature that's different from earlier approaches is that we use proper opaque data which features an inversion layer, which is almost always there in clear atmospheric configurations. In other words, there's a hump at 1,000, 2,000 meters altitude where the scatterer density significantly increases for the larger scatterers that cause me scattering. And we had to slightly smooth the opaque data because that was not curated with rendering in mind. Now, if you think, if you look at those pictures slightly above ground, 2,000 meter looking downwards, if there's such a haze layer above the ground, if we are trying to create a blue sky rendering, wouldn't that show? No. The following images show real photographs. This is on the ground before that glider got towed up. You can see the blue sky has no gradient whatsoever on it. You can't see any discontinuity. And this is from a thousand meters altitude looking downwards. Over the left wing, the right wing, looking ahead. There's this layer that you're looking down on that is absolutely not visible from the ground. So this is normal. This is actually what happens in reality. And we went further. We provide this 
ground proximity scatter layer based on OPAC data, which is available for different viewing conditions from pretty murky to increasingly clear. And this gives you the option of choosing viewing distances. We also work with ozone being a component in that simulated atmosphere, which has to be there for the post-sunset blue in the sky dome to be reasonably correct. You can see on the left, if you do not have ozone in the atmosphere, daytime renderings look all right. But post-sunset, the sky turns gray instead of the steely blue you normally see as after sunset. So this is a gradient of the sun going down and you see the sky turning bluer and bluer. So we then had a huge data set for lots of visibilities, solar elevations, observer altitudes and such generated with a custom path tracer we developed that is based on ART, a polarization rendering research toolkit, simply because that toolkit had things like a file format that stores polarized, polarized radiance as a feature that was all, all already there. We, we used the infrastructure. We validated this against Libratran, so these are just sample plots of us comparing what Atmosim did, that custom renderer, and what Libratran would have said it matched. So we were confident that what this brute force generator did, the 255 gigabytes of polarized images it generated for all those viewing conditions, 348,000 images, that this is more or less what Libratran would have done, just lo lots and lots faster because it was a custom-made renderer that generates entire images. And it generated hemispherical images that could be extended to a full sphere. So these are sample images from the ground level image on the left to higher and higher observer altitudes. Top you see the actual image, bottom you see in red, the degree of polarization you see on the sky dome. This is for a solar elevation that is fairly new, near the horizon. This huge data set we then had to compress. And we did that with the tensor-based data compression. Essentially, the gigantic data set we had, the, those 300,000 300, images, that is one gigantic tensor that we fed to canonical polyadic decomposition to find the salient features. And we had to do some mangling there to enable CPD to find those features. This is described in detail in the supplement. Essentially, from the basic image, you do some infilling to remove the discontinuity as much as possible that the horizon poses. You move it to a special coordinate system, you infill that a little bit so you can interpolate between neighboring images because the shape of this rectangular thing isn't the same depending where you are in the data set. And CPD in this data set finds the dominant features, which is this number salad you see on the right. The coefficient set is the thing you interpolate in. So for another input image, you get different rectangle shape in the shape, the, in the space the CPD analyzes, but the coefficient space is the same. And in that space, you can interpolate and the features interpolate instead of ghosting as if you had done image interpolation. What does this look like? Well, how does this perform? So this is reference versus model for a low solar elevation. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of samples to get this noise free. And this is 100 samples per pixel for the model. Reference versus model. What you can see is a slight blur blurring at the horizon. This was intentionally done to keep the size of the data set down. Reference ver versus model. And here you can quite strongly see the blurring, but remember this is the visible horizon which is hundreds of kilometers away from eight kilometers altitude from an aircraft flying high. So you would rarely see the effect of this in real 
renderings. And even if you see the blur is not really an objectionable, objectionable artifact. We also provide a transmission function, again, brute force data computed, fitting step. The renderings are done such that the SVD, in this case not CPD, can find a structure in the data and the output is a function that can be used to compute transmission for all distances. This is what the function looks like for the transmission. There's also the one polarization channel that we do. We managed to reduce the three polarization components of the four Stokes components to a single one because the dominant feature of sky domes is linear polarization called by Rayleigh scattering in the first order. And if you do that in a specialized coordinate system, you get away with essentially only using the first component. This allows us to get away with two component Stokes images, intensity plus a single linear polarization term that covers the dominant feature. And this is a, an example of polarization rendering. This is a non-polarized rendering, the polarization rendering. There is signif a significant difference there. This is the degree of polarization being shown. This is a reenactment of an old paper, 2004, that had a jerry-rigged polarization model, shows qualitatively similar results, except that this is now something you can rely on because it's been matched against Libratran. What you can also do with this fit is something you can do in real life. If you have distant vistas of objects in a hazy atmosphere, by rotating a polarization filter in front of those, you can reduce the inscattered radiance, the Rayleigh part of the inscattered radiance. So this is a rendering a distant house, and if you put a polarizer in front of this, you see you can take the blue scattering out a little bit. It's a subtle effect, but it actually corresponds to what you can do in reality. It's not like in, that you in reality can take out the entire inscattered light or haze with a polarization filter. And this is all from a pre-computed model that's essentially in a jar. This was integrated into a rendering product that's actually on sale, the Corona renderer, and can be used to render large outdoor scenes like this. We also have a movie that shows what this looks like if you do a flyover of a city. Essentially, all the radiance you see in this movie is out of the jar and corresponds to what Libratran would have delivered. So, to conclude, we provide a comprehensive fitted sky model, which is a first, that offers the advantage of giving you reasonably reliable radiance and transmission data for realistic atmospheres. The whole thing is open source, see the QR code, feel free to download both the data set and the code that can be used to access the data. Note that we do not only provide the 2.4 gig original fit, but also slimmed down versions with reduced features. And in the future, we will work on increased realism of the brute force step, such as full me scattering and atmospheric refraction, and possibly also different haze scenarios. I would like to thank you for your attention and we are open for interactive questions.